Here we go again, back to Basics Bible Study. I am your host, your facilitator, your teacher for the hour, Reverend Corey Evans Sr., and you have tuned in to Back to Basics Bible Study. This is our weekly virtual Bible study via Zoom line where God placed upon our heart a couple of years ago to get back to basics, and, and he meant just that, to get back to studying his word book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, word by word if necessary, so the people of God can get a true meaning of the content and the context of God's word. Uh, our job is to understand the plans, the purposes, and promises of God. And you can't do that just by pulling one word study or one verse study. You have to study the scripture in totality of how, when, and why it was written. Amen. Amen. So, Welcome to Back to Basics Bible Study. Come on in, get relaxed, get your Bibles in front of you, get your notepads, your pens. Uh, if you're new to our Bible study, we walk straight down the page, uh, straight down the uh, written text and take it in totality and pausing when necessary, when the Spirit tells us to, to explain what we need to explain. So we have matriculated down to Job chapter 34. Get that in front of you. Don't close your Bibles. Keep it right there in front of you. And we're going to get at least four chapters in tonight. We will close out the book of Job on next Thursday. So with that being said, anyone that um, is on by Zoom line, thank you. We, you're welcome, welcome, welcome. Sit back and relax and receive the word of God. Uh, we just ask that you will send out the link that you receive. Send it out to any and everybody that uh, you have in your context list. They got time to come on. Hey, I can let them on as I'm teaching. Those of you guys that are listening in later by um, YouTube, we just ask that you subscribe, uh, like, share. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't even cost you any time. Um, just subscribe, like, share, hit the notifications bell so you'll be prompted when I post new videos every week. And go back and watch the old videos. Uh, anyone is listening to me, no matter about what vehicle, go back and watch the old videos, but don't just watch them, learn from them, but subscribe, like the videos and share. Why? When you do that, you're doing your part to push out the gospel because YouTube feels if you look at it and like it, then someone else would like it. So they will push that out. Amen. So make sure to subscribe, like, share to all the videos on the YouTube channel. Um, my brothers and sisters around the world that are listening in by the radio blog ministry, uh, I love you as well. Thank you so very much. Keep coming on to the radio blog ministry. And if you have, and when you have access to um, the internet, go to our YouTube page. Just search Corey Evans Sr., C O R E Y E V A N S S R, Corey Evans Sr., or search Back to Basic Bible Study and it will come up. Subscribe to our channel so you can receive all the teaching that you've missed. Amen. Amen. Without uh, further ado, after that long introduction, let's jump into Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. Now, uh, as I've said before, the breakdown or basic outline of Job is chapter one and part of chapter two was the prologue. It was it was God's bragging about or stating uh, his view of Job's faithfulness and Job's walk with him. Then we saw that the enemy, the devil, Satan himself, came to God searching to and fro whom he may devour whom he may test, and a test came about. Uh, the devil felt that uh, if the only reason why Job is, is faithful and is honest as he is to you, God, is because your hand, you bless him so because of his walk. Uh, you bless him so because of his faith. You bless him so um, because of his thoughts of you and his reverence of you and everything that you have given him. Now, if you take all of that away from him, he will curse you to your face. Um, and so God, of course, then said, um, you can have your way with your attack against Job, but to show dominance, um, to show his stance and uh, his statue and his positioning in creation and on this earth, God said, you cannot touch his life. Uh, the enemy doesn't give life, so the enemy doesn't, you know, cannot usurp God and take life away. 
God controls everything, even the enemy. So, um, so then you see in chapter, starting chapter three, was human wisdom and suffering. You saw people like Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, his Job's three best friends and confidants come to Job and talk to him and tell him over and over again how he has, has some type of hidden sin and have fallen short before God and that he should confess whatever hidden sin that is so that he could be restored. Um, go ahead and confess. You're not the righteous man you proclaim to be. Uh, you need to go ahead and confess what it is. So then starting um, with, we're in that section now, but then we're going to have divine wisdom and suffering starting chapter 38. So we're going to do 34, 35, 36, 37. And if we get to chapter 38, that's going to start divine wisdom instead of human wisdom. Okay. That's your separation there. Human wisdom and suffering is chapter three through 37. Divine wisdom is going to start 38. So you're going to see the difference. Now in Job, remember, this is this is literature. This is poetry. This is wisdom books. This is literature, poetry, or wisdom. You can clump that into those categories. So it reads a lot differently than, and it's easier to read, but it reads a lot differently than your books of law. Amen. So come on in, relax. Let's jump into it. That's enough said. Let's remember, as we start chapter 34, remember and I put this in your notes, remember what was said in chapter 33. So allow me to read this very quickly. 33 and 8 says, surely you have spoken in my hearing. And remember, after Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar said what they had to say, we was introduced to a new character, which was Elihu, E-L-I-H-U, -E was a younger man, but a man full of wisdom. Uh, he was a younger man, and he had sat back and listened. Because of his uh, age, he honored the elders or the people older than him. So he had to sit back and listen to Job and listen to the three friends and everything that was said. And then God used him. God spoke to him. God showed him. God used him to share a word with not only Job, but the three people, the three best friends around Job as well. But this, remember what he said, which is the turning point of the book of Job. 33 and 8 started saying this, surely you have spoken in my hearing and I have heard the sound of your words saying, this is Elihu speaking, I heard you say, Job, I am pure. Mm. I'm without transgression. I am innocent and there is no iniquity in me. Verse 10, yet he, God, finds occasions against me, he counts me as his enemy, God's enemy. He meaning God. He puts my feet in the stocks. God puts my feet in the stock. God watches all my paths. Verse 12, look, in this you are not righteous. Elihu told the righteous man, the most righteous man walking the earth at this time, as we like to say, he told him to his face, look, in everything that you said, your frame of mind, your demeanor, the words that came out of your mouth, in this, you are not righteous. This young man told this mighty man of valor, Job, in everything that you said in that dissertation, you are not righteous. He says, I will answer you for God is greater than man. What was he saying? For Job to say how pure and perfect he was, he was putting himself on the same level plane as God. There is none righteous, there is none perfect, no, not one, to ever walk the face of this earth but Christ Jesus. And we're in the New Testament. Christ Jesus was nowhere on the face of the earth, so Job was putting himself on the level of, he didn't know about Jesus, but he was putting himself on the level of God and Jesus to come. And we know that's not true. 
And he was also out of the same mouth saying, God is doing all of these things to me. God is causing all of these things to happen to me. God is, God is, God is, God is punishing me. God took away my family. God took away my wealth. God took away my health. God attacked me. God is doing these things to me. But I, 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 I am righteous. I am holy. I am perfect. I have done these things to help the needy. I have helped the widows. I have helped the orphans. I have helped the unclothed. I have helped the hungry. I am perfect in all my ways. Oh, but you don't hear talk like this in your church, do you? <laughs> because it's not. We, we as preachers pick the part of the book or story to where we can over sensationalize the story. We can get excited and get you excited about Job never cursed God and never turned his back on God. Job was perfect. Job was this, Job was that. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And when we do things like that, we miss the true sense of why the book of Job was written. So this young man, Elihu, came up and says, you are not righteous. But look at the words he said in, 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 in verse 12. He says, look, in this, you are not righteous. In what he had just said, that Job did what I heard come out of your mouth in that, Job, you are not righteous. Not in everything. Not in, I'm not talking about your walk. I'm not talking about your viewpoint on God. I'm not talking about anything like that. Your reverence for God. I'm talking about when you in, oh my God, there it is. In the midst of your storm, how you are acting, you are falling short. You are not righteous. Outside of the storm, Oh, I give it to you, Job. I give you all, all the proclaim that I can put upon you saying that you are righteous and you are holy. Yes, but in the midst of the storm, you are falling short. And that's what this young brother told Job. Oh, you falling short. When you going through, you ain't the same as you were when you was going to. <laughs> you ain't the same. The words that are coming out of your mouth are not the words that was coming out of your mouth when you was going to or before the storm, but in the midst, as you are going through, as everything has been taken away, your words are changing. And you need to watch the words that are coming out of your mouth. In this, you are not righteous, is what the young man says. For God is greater than man, and we miss those three little lines when we're teaching Job. In this, Job, you are not righteous. Let me answer you to what nobody else has answered you. God is greater than man. If you take the stance that you are taking, you are taking a position that you are greater or equal to God. And no one is that. Come on, somebody. Come on, understand it. We got to teach Job the right way. We can't keep heaping on all these praise and glorified phrases on Job. No, Job, Job was a man. Job is not perfect. Same scenario. Your pastors, preachers, bishops, whatever title they want to have for themselves, they are just a man. Stop heaping up all these praises on the man like they cannot fall and they're perfect. That's why when they fall, you got such a problem with it because you have put them on such a high pedestal thinking that they're not human. The man of God, the woman of God is human. Stop acting like they're Jesus when they're not. If they fall short, they're doing exactly what the Bible says every single person on this earth does. We've all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we have an advocate with the Father that if we confess our sins, he's faithful enough to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Everyone falls. 
But if you act like Job and act like I'm perfect and I'm greater than I'm, I'm equal playing with God, that's where you have a problem. Now, now that the stage is set, let's get to let's get into chapter 34. Elihu proclaims God's justice. Elihu, now get your study Bible. If you don't have a study Bible, what you're waiting on, I tell you every single week, get you a study Bible. If you don't have a good one, call me, email me, text me. I'll send you the ISBN to a great one. Elihu proclaims God's justice. So we know what chapter 34 is about. Let's tone in on that. Let's focus in on that. Okay, 34. Elihu further answered and said, because remember, in the original transcripts, there was no divisions of chapters. This was all in the same one verse after another. So he is continuing. Elihu further answered and said, that's why I read you that part of 33, because it leads to this. Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. <laughs> For the ear tests, oh my God, the ear tests words just as the platelet tastes food. Oh my God, that'll preach right there. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my justice. Should I lie concerning my right? That's what Job says. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. No, Job, you are not perfect. What man is like Job, who drinks scorn like water, who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men? I'm speeding up because I'm getting somewhere. For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should delight in God. Verse 10, here we go. Therefore, Listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. There is no wickedness in God. There is no iniquity in God is what he's saying. So all these wicked things that are happening, how dare you blame God is what he's saying. Verse 11, for he repays man according to man's work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. There it is. There it is. He repays the great things. He rewards the great things, but he treats us according to our work. He wants us to be obedient and faithful to him. Oh, this young brother is preaching and teaching right now. They just not receiving it. Verse 12, surely God will never do wickedly. There is no evil and wickedness in God. It's not a part of his attributes, part of his makeup, people. Nor will the almighty pervert justice because God is just. He will reward and he will chastise. That's what he's saying. God is a just God. Verse 13, who gave him God? Young people, I keep telling you every week when you see capitalization in the middle of a sentence that is talking about the divine. That's a little trick of Bible study that we learn to make sure that you can keep in your brain who is speaking or who it is speaking about. Who gave him, capital H, who gave God charge over the earth? Who gave him that authority? Or who appointed God, him, over the whole world? Hmm. If he should set his heart on it, God, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Who gave God authority? Nobody. What is this young man saying? He's saying there is none above God. There is no authoritative figure above God. God is before time and above all time and above all things because God created all things. No one gives him the authority. He gives authority. He does what he wants, when he wants, whenever he wants. He's sovereign. That's what this young man is saying. If you have understanding, verse 16, 
And verse 15 says, if he wants to, he'll cause everything to cease because he created all things. Let me make sure to say that. Now, 16, if you have understanding, hear this. Listen to the sound of my words, verse 17. Should one who hates justice govern? Hmm. Will you condemn him who is most just? Capital H. So will you condemn God who is the most just? Is it fitting to say to a king in his kingdom that you are worthless and to nobles that you are wicked? No, you don't have the authority to do that, even in a natural. Verse 19, yet he, God, is not partial to prince. He is above prince and kings and nobles. Nor does he, God, regard the rich poor more than the poor. He's no respecter of persons. You better get this. I'm teaching today. For they are all the work of his, capital H, God's hands. Mm. All of these people can never be above the creator because they are a creation. Verse 20. And in a moment, they die. And in the middle of the night, going back to what he says, he can cause all things to cease if he wanted to. In a moment, they die. And in the middle of the night, the people are shaken and pass away. The mighty are taken away without a hand. Mm. Things were created by what? Just the words of God. He's spoken into existence. He can speak it and all things can cease. It is so much to impact in these verses. It is so powerful and profound, you can't just rush through it. Verse 21, for his, capital H, so God, for God's eyes are on the ways of man, not vice versa, and God sees all, little h, his steps. So, and God sees all man's steps because he orders and directs man's steps. He's in control of all things. Verse 22, there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. You can't hide from God. He sees all. For, for he, God, need not further consider a man, oh my God, that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks in pieces mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Verse 25, therefore he knows their works. He knows your works. He knows my works. Hidden and public. He overthrows them in the night and they are crushed. He strikes them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turned back from him. He chastises. He rewards and he chastises and would not consider any of his ways so that they cause the cry of the poor to come to him, for he hears the cry of the afflicted. If you cause any harm to the less fortunate, when they cry out, God hears that. 29, when he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? When he, when, and when he hides his face, who then can see him? whether it is against a nation or a man alone. Verse 30, that the hypocrite should not reign, lest the people be ensnared. 31, for has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening. I will offend no more. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. 33, should he repay it according to your terms. What's it? What's it? Teach me what I do not see if I have done iniquity. So should he repay iniquity according to your terms just because you disavow it? Oh my God. <laughs> you are not God. He is. He repays or rewards according to his terms, not yours. You must choose and not I. Therefore, speak what you know. Men of understanding say to me, wise men who listen to me, Job speaks, here we go, 35, underline it. Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. Look at what this young man is telling them. 
after I remember this is poetry, this is wisdom literature. So all that he's building up what he's saying in 35, Job is speaking without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. Mm. 36, oh, huh. that Job were tried to the utmost because his answers are like those of wicked men. Oh my God. He did not just say that. Oh, Young Buck said that. Young Buck says his words are without wisdom because his answers are like those of wicked men. You three, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar have challenged Job and his answers to you are like those of wicked men is what he says. He should be able to defend himself and defend God as a just and righteous man, but he defended God and defended himself as a wicked man. Do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? 37, for he asked rebel. Oh my God. Here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Why? Why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? 37 is your answer. Because he asked rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Mm. There it is. Oh, but you don't hear this teaching in church, do you? Job was the most righteous man on earth. Job never did wrong. Job was perfect in all his ways because they take that section of scripture of Job bragging about his righteousness instead of bragging about his righteousness in God. And they teach you a whole sermon concerning Job's righteousness in the midst of the storm, and there was none. Oh, he had a lot of righteousness before the storm, but during the storm, he fell short. Elihu says, in this, you are not righteous, is what he told him. Do you see why we have to go back to basics, get back to the basics and teach the Bible as we should in totality, the whole book? Don't teach anything out of Job without reading the entire book of Job. At least the entire chapter or two or three chapters or the grouping of chapters that that text comes from. Then you will see, oh, you can't use those particular verses to preach from if your basis of your theology of your preaching is that Job was so perfect in the midst of the storm. No, he wasn't. He cursed the day he was born. He cursed the night he was conceived and he put it all on God of everything that is happening to him. Did I read to you where he said, the devil is tempting me and I will stand firm and fast in the midst <laughs> of my storm and will, no, he didn't say that. Did you hear me read that to you in all these sessions about Job? No, you didn't hear me read that to you. So why do we preach it that way? Now, if you want to preach it from that standpoint, you got to preach it. You got to take those scriptures before the test. But during the test, you better be preaching. You fall, Job fall. You fall short, Job fell short. Job was tested, you are tested. In the midst of Job's storm, he cursed the day he was born. You do this. Oh, yeah, you better be preaching it like that. That's how you better preach it. Because that's contextually correct. But now, don't get it twisted now. I'm not saying that Job cursed God because what the test was that he would curse God to his face and turn his back on God. No, he never did that now. Don't get it twisted. I'm not saying he did that. He was still faithful in the parameters of the test. But he was still just a man, my brother, my sister. Teach it correctly. He was still just a man. He was hurting. And you can't blame Job because Job is a whole lot stronger than you are. Okay? And he didn't have Jesus to call upon. <laughs> he didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit either. The New Testament had come about yet. So don't blame Job because he's dealing with what he had to deal with. Do you hear me? He had not been able to draw upon the wisdom and the knowledge of seeing a perfect man walk this earth and give us the examples that Christ Jesus gave us to, to draw upon. No, 
He can't go home and read the Bible. No. So don't blame Job. Don't blame Job. Now the words of Moses was there, but don't blame Job because he's doing very well according to what he had to draw from. Amen, somebody. Amen. All right. Verse 30, I mean, chapter 35. Let's go. Chapter 35. Stop building Job up like he was perfect. He wasn't. He was a man. Stop building up man now or woman now like they perfect. They're not. They're not. Oh, I got to say this. I got to say this. Let me tell you some teachers, preachers of the gospel. No matter what title you want to carry, that don't matter. You're a teacher, preacher of the gospel. Learn something about when you're going to be attacked. And I'm just giving you this because the Spirit said give it to you right here and right now. So I'm going to say it once and I'm going to leave it alone. People admire your anointing. People are drawn to your anointing. Don't be surprised when you're attacked. When things happen in your life that has nothing to do with the church or nothing to do with your calling or your assignment, when the attack will come, they will attack your anointing. <laughs> Hear me well. They will attack what they see in you that they respect the most. They won't attack you personally, my sister, as whoever you are, Judy, Mary, Nancy. They won't attack that. They will attack your anointing. They won't attack you, brother, Scott, Barry, Larry. No, they attack and come against your anointing because what they respect and what they are drawn to is the anointing. They see the power of the anointing that's upon you. So when they attack you, it may not have anything to do because you will fall. And whatever happens has nothing to do with your anointing. But when you get attacked, notice they will attack your anointing. That's what they will come against. But I come to tell you that that's the one thing they can't control. <laughs> so stop worrying about people attacking your anointing because God anointed you and God is the only one that can take it away. Amen, somebody. And don't think that it can't be taken away. Respect your anointing. Hear me, hear me, chosen people of God. Don't think that your anointing cannot be taken away. Acts, Acts Saul. Hmm. Your anointing can be taken away. It can be taken off of you and given to David. That's why David said, please, Father, do not take thy hand from me and thy anointing from me. Because he saw it taken from one and placed upon another. Do you hear me? Amen. That's a teaching for somebody. Let's move. Elihu condemns self-righteousness. He condemns self-righteousness. So that title right there shows you what he has been talking about previously, Joe self-righteousness. I have been perfect. I have been holy. I have done all these things. I am right standing with God. I, 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 not I am this in God because of God. No one is holy. No, not one. No one is righteous. No, not one. It's, it's the Holy Spirit, the God in you that makes you righteous. Okay. All right. So don't, don't, don't act like Job. Know that your power, your anointing, your calling, anything that you have, if every good and perfect gift comes from above. So anything that you have that's good and perfect, anything that you have comes from God. And you better rest in that. It's not in and of yourself. It is of God. And that's what Job fell short. And that's what we have to teach. Come on, let's go. Chapter 35, moreover. Elihu answered and said, do you think this is right? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? Have you ever heard that taught? Have you ever even heard that read in your church about Job? No, we don't deal with it correctly. Do you, do you think this right to say my righteousness is more than God? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have more than if I had sinned? Oh my God. I will answer you, listen to Elihu, and your companions with you. <laughs> I'm about to tell all of y'all something. Look at the heavens and, and see 
and behold the clouds. They are higher than you. He's establishing levels of standard. If you sin, what do you accomplish against God, against him, capital H? Or if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him, God? If you are righteous, what do you give God? <laughs> or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects a man such as you and your righteousness, a son of man, because of the multitude of oppressions, they cry out. They cry out for help because the arm of the mighty, not the arm, arm of the mighty, but no one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than birds of heaven. There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. Verse 13, surely God will not listen to empty talk nor will the almighty God regard it. Although you say you do not see him, yet justice is before you and you must wait for him. And now because he has not punished in his anger, nor taking much notice of folly, therefore Job opens his mouth in vain. He multiplies words without knowledge. Oh my God, do you hear this young buck telling these people, telling these great men of valor, telling them about themselves and especially Job. Job, you are acting self-righteous. You are acting self-righteous. Oh my God, do you get it? Put in the comments for you. Have you ever heard it taught like this? Tell me now, tell me. You ever heard it taught like this? You ever heard that sermon come through how bad Job was and how he was falling short? Because I've never heard it. Maybe I've just been in the wrong church. I ain't going to say that. But, but, but I, haven't heard it. I haven't heard it talk correctly. Okay? I've only heard about how perfect Job was. Come on, guys. Chapter 36. Let's move. Now, after Elihu is moving past chastising Job, now he's saying, Elihu proclaims God's goodness. He proclaims God's goodness. So get that in your brain. That's what we're about to talk about in your study Bible, chapter 36. Elihu also proceeded. I see your comment. Give me those comments. Elihu also proceeded and said also. So this is a continuation. Remember, the original manuscripts were not broken down in chapters. Okay. So. Elihu also proceeded and said, bear with me a little, and I will show you <laughs> that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. Oh, my God. Did he just say that? Did he just say that? Give me a minute. I'm about to tell you what thus <laughs> saith the Lord is what he said. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker, to God, capital M, God. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Verse five, behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength of understanding. <laughs> He does not preserve the life of the wicked, but gives justice to the oppressed. My God is a just God. He's a mighty God is what he says. Verse seven, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings for he has seated them forever. And they, the righteous, are exalted. And if they are bound in feathers, the righteous, if they are bound in feathers, hell in course of affliction, then he, God, tells them their work and their transgressions, that they have acted defiantly. Do you, oh my God, did you, did you miss that? He's saying, <laughs> he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, okay? He holds, the, he holds the righteous in his hands. But 
If they are who, if you went past that verse too quickly, you missed it. If they are bound in feathers and held in cords of affliction, then he tells them their work and their transgressions. He tells them what they have done, that they have acted defiantly. Did you get it? Did you get it? Oh my God. He's saying to Job, and it went right over their head. He's, well, let me not say that. He's saying to Job, if it was of God to do this to you, then God would have spoken to you <laughs> exactly what you have did wrong <laughs> because he will give you the opportunity to correct it if it was from God. So how dare you say that this is from God and God did this to you because he would have, the tattletale sign of it is that if he would have done this to you, verse nine says, then he tells them their work where they fall short and their transgressions that they have acted defiantly against him. He speaks to his righteous and you probably missed that when you read it. He has proven to him, this is not coming from God, is what he is saying. Verse 10, he also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. My brother, my sister, hear me, hear me. Get this, get this, get this. Come here, come a little close, come a little close. If you're going through something and you want to know, is it of God or of the devil? Pray, rest in your prayer, meditate on it. God will give you correction. He will give you instruction <laughs> and he will give you direction. <laughs> he, will, he will give you those things. And if he gives you those things, then you know that everything you've been going through was from God and of God to correct you, instruct you, and take you to another level. If it's of God, he is teaching you. He is using it to take things away from you, to add things to you, but he has to prove to you first what you are doing wrong, but he will never leave you there. He will give you instruction so that you can get better and change the things that you are doing that is in defiance of him. That they have acted defiantly. He also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. If you don't get instruction and correction in the midst of your storm, everything you're going through is directly from the devil. Do you hear me? Because he's not going to give you correction and instruction to get better. He's going to keep beating you down and beating you down and beating you down. Because he wants you, in this example of Job, he wants you to turn your back on God. But if you're going through some things, but you're receiving from God instruction and correction, then you know that it's of God. So no, oh, this is just a test. <laughs> This just a trial. Okay, trouble don't last always. <laughs> Joy cometh in the morning. <laughs> okay, he's just using this to mold me and shape me and correct me. <laughs> and he's just using it to get me to where he wants me to be in him. So if you're going through a test and trial, listen. Listen to the voice of God. But don't be self-righteous. Don't blame God. Pray to God, meditate to God, and listen to that still, small, quiet voice in your spirit, by his spirit, to your spirit, this, his spirit that's within you. He will speak to your spirit. Listen to that voice. And when you see that correction, oh, all oh, this was of God just to get me to a different level. But if you don't hear that, you better start praying and denouncing and rebuking and turning against and putting the enemy under your feet all you can and speaking the name of Jesus over it and putting the blood, putting it under the blood. And you better start doing, you better go into warfare then because you know where it's coming from. If God don't give you that instruction and correction. It's not of him because he wants you to get better. The enemy wants you to get worse 
and to turn your back against God. So you better go into your closet and get that spiritual warfare on. Do you hear me? Oh, that just blessed somebody right there. Somebody needed to hear that. Just, just bless somebody. But then it closed out chapter 11. It says, if they obey and serve him, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Oh my God. But if they do not obey him, see, God is just, he's just, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. 13, but the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. He's calling Job a hypocrite. Oh, all this talking walk you did before the storm, where's that now? Where's that now? You should be saying, oh, nothing of this is from God or of God because God blesses me and God keeps me and he, and he protects me and his loving arms are around me. So nothing, nothing evil comes from God. No, that's what he should have been saying. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Verse 13, but the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. They do not cry for help when he binds them, there it is. Job should have been crying out to God. God, I'm being attacked. God, the enemy's hand is upon me. God, the enemy is beating me down every day. God, the enemy has taken my family. God, the enemy has, has attacked my body. God, help me. Deliver me. Restore me. Heal me. Did you hear any of that in those verses? Did you hear Job say that? Any of that in those verses? You see how it's being taught incorrectly? Get to the text. The text teaches us everything we need to know. But the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. They do not cry for help when he binds them. If this was a text from God, if God did this to you, all you had to do was cry out to God and ask for help. Verse 14, they die who do not cry out. They die out in you, die in you, and their life ends among the perverted persons. 15, he delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. Well, how do you know all those things you said five minutes ago, Rev? Because I studied the whole chapter. That's why I know what to tell you five minutes before this verse. He delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their eyes, open their ears rather, in oppression. When you're being afflicted, when you're being oppressed, when you, when you have your tests and your trials, open your ears to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. If you can hear the voice of God, then what is happening to you is only a test. If you can't hear the voice of God, now you got to listen. If some of it is on you too. If you're not tuned in to the right station, all you got is static, baby. So you better tune into God and turn that knob to the right station so you can hear his voice. Because if you haven't been praying, if you haven't been meditating, it's far worse for you to hear the voice of God. It's got to be a daily walk. So if you can't hear that, and you know that you have been hearing from God, then you know that it's attack of the enemy. Then you know where your spiritual warfare is. Then you know what you got to do. Then you better start rebuking and denouncing everything that you possibly can and putting it under the blood. Do you hear this teaching? Do you hear me? Because God delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. Verse 16, indeed, he, God, who have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place where there is no restraint and what is set on your table will be full of riches, richness. But you are filled with the judgment do the wicked. Oh my God. Judgment and justice take hold of you, Joe, because there is wrath. Beware, lest he, God, take you away with one blow. This young buck is telling Job, you better change your ways and change your mouth and what is coming out of your mouth before God takes you away from here. 
for a large ransom would not help you to avoid it. No matter how much money you have or wealth you have, it's nothing, no amount of money you can offer God to hold back his wrath from you if you turn your back on God. Hey, hey, come on, somebody. Verse 19, will your riches or all the mighty forces keep you from distress? Do not desire the, do not desire the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, do not turn to iniquity, for you have chosen this rather than affliction. Behold, God is exalted by God's power. See that capital H? Telling you, young folk, look at capitalization. Behold, God is exalted by his, God's power, not by nobody else's. God is self-existing. Oh, my God. In and of himself, God needs no help to be powerful. God needs no help to be all-powerful. He needs no help to be almighty. He needs no help to be all-righteous. That is, he is that in and of himself. No one else can say that. Who teaches like him? 23. Who is assigned him his way? Nobody. He assigned his way to himself. Or who has said you have done wrong? Oh, my God. Look at if your study Bible gives you another heading in the middle of the chapter. Elihu proclaims God's majesty. We got to move now. He proclaims God's majesty. Remember the mighty, oh, remember to magnify his, capital H, his work, God's work, of which men have sung about, sung praises to. Remember to remember or to magnify his work. Everyone has seen his work. Man looks on it from afar. Verse 26, behold, God is great and we do not know him, God. Our brains cannot even wrap around exactly who God is, nor can the number of his years be discovered. He precedes time. 27, for he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. 29. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Mm. Look, he scatters his lights upon it and covers the depths of the sea. For by this, he judges the people and gives food and abundance. He covers his hands without lighting and commands it to strike. His thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. Oh my God, chapter 37, let's wind it down. Now it is God's works and wisdom. This is building upon what he just said, the majesty of God, the magnitude of God. 37, at this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. My heart leaps out of my chest for this. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole heaven. His lightning, and remember this poetry though, he's building up. He sends it forth under the whole heaven. His lightning to the ends of the earth, talking about thunder and lightning, what you see and what you hear that comes from God. After it, at, after it, a voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. I got to slow down. I'm so excited. Uh, I got to slow down. God thunders marvelously with his voice. Thunder and lightning, what you see and what you hear is from the voice of God. He does great things in the verse five, which we cannot comprehend. Oh my God. He said all that to say, he does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow fall on the earth. Likewise, to the gentle rain and the heavy rain on his strength, he seals the hand of every man. Here we go. That all men may know his work. He does these things so that you can see all these things happening in the earth to know that this is from God and how mighty God is. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. They hibernate and they sleep. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds of the north. He just talked about the majesty, the majesty of God. Verse 13 says, he causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Do you hear that? He causes everything to come, whether for correction or for his land 
or for his mercy. Verse 14, listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wonderful works of God. You remember the verse, stand still <laughs> and see, <laughs> right? That's what he's telling them. Verse 15, do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of the cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wonderful works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when he quiets the earth by the south wind? Why do you get hot in temperature? Why do you do that? When he causes the wind to seep, to cease from cooling you off. That's what he's saying. Teach us what we should say to him, for, for we can prepare nothing because of the darkness. He holds back the light. He causes the light. He causes the darkness. Verse 22, I got to move. With God is awesome majesty. Verse 23, as for the almighty, we cannot find him. My brother, my sister, listen to me. Point to where specifically God is in one spot. You can't. Your brain cannot phantom that. God is everywhere. He's a spirit. But we can't do that. As for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is excellent in power, in judgment, and abundant justice. He does not oppress. Therefore, men fear him. He shows no partiality in any who are wise of heart. Boom. There it is. There it is. Our God is almighty. He's majestic. He's all powerful. He's wonderful. He's everything. He causes everything to happen. He causes everything to cease. He causes everything to be. Look at how this young man is bringing things to the remembrance of Job, chastising Job and telling Job everything he has done. And so much wisdom and knowledge has been given to this man. Not because he had it in and of himself, because of the vision that God placed upon him. He said in himself in a vision and in a dream, and God is allowing him to bring forth wonderful knowledge and wisdom to these individuals that are even much older than he. Oh my God. Oh my God. We will start chapter 38 on next week. Oh my God. Y'all got me excited over here. Yeah, I'm telling you. So we're going to do 38 through 42 on next week. Amen. Amen. As I always say in closing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May this word grow as seed in your spirit and manifest in your heart. May your love of God grow through your knowledge of God's word. My brother, my sister, God bless you for coming on. Continue to come on to Back to Basics Bible Study on the Zoom line. There will never, ever be a fee to come on this line, God's gospel is free. You don't pay for a blessing. Any money that you give unto God through tithes and offering, that's being obedient to God. You don't pay for blessings. Anytime you hit on the internet, that is false. You will never be asked to pay for this teaching. All that I ask is to copy and paste the link and send it to everybody you know so that they will come on this line. Copy and paste that link and share it to everybody. Now, if you are listening in by YouTube, please subscribe, like, share, like all the other videos that I have on there. This is session 138. Go and give me 138 likes. Listen to them first. Make your notes. Learn from them. And then like every video that will show YouTube to push out this gospel to everybody else. Everybody that's listening in by the radio vlog ministry, I love you as well. Continue to come on listening in by radio. And when you get access to the internet, go to our YouTube page, Corey Evans Sr. or Back to Basics Bible Study and receive this teaching. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and keep you as my prayer. As I always say, I love you. God loves you. Continue to come back for this teaching. Amen. We'll see you next week for Back to Basics Bible Study. God bless.